everyone? Did you learn some new names? This means yes, this means no. <laughs> All right. This is a communication event here. All right. So, um, so let's pray. And then I want you to hear um, Jess's story. We all have a story. We are called up from our broken stories into the unstoppable story of God. And all we have to do is say yes. So let's call on another name, the name of Jesus, and let's open our stories to his and then hear hers. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that today, um, Lord, that we would move beyond religion, that we would move beyond concern for appearance. God, that we would move beyond concern for control. And Lord, that we would enter into your presence, believing we're loved and your love will never stop, it will never fail, believing that you never give up on our stories. So Father, may none of us keep our lives back from you. May none of us seek to write our own stories, but to give them to you, to let you create in them what you designed from the beginning. Father, thank you for the story of Jesus and how it changes ours. We pray this in his name as all God's people say, Amen. 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 Hi. Good morning. Good morning. My little brother, Paul, was always the first to hop out of the car when it stopped moving, often before we even put it into park. This one Sunday, however, after I drove him home from church, he sat just an extra moment with me to appreciate one or two of quirks of my car, namely that the sunroof would go all the way open and all the way close after I took the key out of the ignition. <laughs> we laughed and proceeded on our day. This and so many other mundane moments turned priceless later that day when I learned I would never sit in a car and laugh with my little brother again. After dropping him off, I headed out for the day. My parents called that evening and told me it was time to come home. It was one of those calls where you just know. You don't ask, you just go. I got home and there was a police car waiting in the driveway. I braced myself and went inside. Paul had spent the afternoon hanging out with a friend and then riding his motorcycle home that night he clipped the corner of some stone steps hidden in a grassy embankment. He lost control and the bike collided with a telephone pole. He was pronounced dead at the scene. He was a high school senior and it turned two we 18 two weeks before. When the officer finished talking, I went into to-do mode. I called my three older siblings. I notified friends and family. I informed his high school and I drove many of the funeral logistics over the course of the next week. I continued to try to support my family for the next weeks and months afterwards. I made sure mom ate, and I went with her to church every Sunday. I stood beside her, but I felt no connection to God. I felt like worshiping God meant that I had to be content with his plan, which meant that I had to be happy that my brother had died. I couldn't understand why God's plan would have something like this happen. But I stayed in community with other believers, in connect groups, and studying his word. And the funny thing is, everywhere I looked, God showed up. And he taught me something about his character and about mine. Through my first if gathering, I learned that God will meet you wherever you are and that sometimes it's okay to not have anything to say. Sometimes he just wants you to listen. In a study on Gideon, I learned how to have strength in weakness. And when things seem completely impossible on your own, that's where God really steps in. I learned that some things are designed in such a way that they can only be achieved through God. Likewise, I learned that patience 
is not an inherent personality trait. It is a skill developed through practice and through waiting. I learned that letting my guard down and showing vulnerability is a way to build relationships. Vulnerability has never been particularly easy for me, but I feel like I'm learning to trust God and I am slowly outgrowing my reluctance to be vulnerable. I didn't fully give up on God and he certainly didn't give up on me. While I still don't understand why my brother died, I choose to believe that it's part of a bigger plan. I choose to trust God, whatever his reason for Paul's death. And now, I try for my first and foremost prayer to be not that God's plan aligns with my wants, but that my heart aligns with his plan. All of us have felt like God's love has failed us at some point, every one of us. And what we do in those moments is so critical, and what we do in the days and years afterwards is just, is just, um, is life-changing. Part of the problem is that we've misframed our context. We um, are really living as though we were on a cruise and the simple reality is that we are actually on a rescue from the Titanic. Something disastrous has happened in the world. It has been broken and sin has invaded life and, and life is now uh, you know, the child of chaos. And, and, and we misframe the situation. We are like passengers who believe we've paid for a cruise and, and are owed something different. And, and the reality is that Father knows the ship is sinking and is engaging in, in this amazing rescue. And we resent him for it. And too often we see that his love, believe that his love is, has failed. Guys, I want to challenge you uh, as we kind of move towards the, the endings of our worship series to worship your way through all of your living and to recognize that, that you are called to overcome the gravity of a broken world through the upward pull of worship. That there is a God who made you, who's calling you into his life and into himself, and you've got a choice to make about how you're going to live. You can live in the gravity of the sin, and the gravity of the broken, and the gravity of your own thought, or you can answer the upward call of, of the Spirit of God into, into the life of, of Father. But I want to say that worship is not natural, it's supernatural. Supernatural means it's above natural. And what's natural is to live in this broken world, to think our broken thoughts, uh, to seek broken things, and to break ourselves and the people around us, and then pass our brokenness on to the generations after us. That's what's natural. But worship is supernatural. And the scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, that's the key to everything. In view of God's mercy, living your life seeing what God sees, living your life looking towards the horizon. This is one of the reasons why I like to go out west at least once a year um, and to stand, you know, kind of in the desert and just look from left to right and just be able to see sky meet earth in every direction. <laughs> and that's that's the context of this verse. Is, you know, I, I'm urging you to do something, but you've you got to have a, a, a vision in your mind before this is going to work. And, and, and the vision in your mind has to be of the all-encompassing mercy of God. Right? That's the background of everything. So in, in view of this mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. We've talked about in the Old Testament that a sacrifice was something that was offered on the altar. The altar was not something static. It was something burning. You offered your offering um, on the altar, and you did not reach in to get it back because it was on fire. <laughs> so, so Paul is saying, I'm, I'm urging you, in light of, of the incredible love of God, in, in light of his endless mercy in every direction, I'm urging you 
to give all of your living over to God in a way that is hands off and, and no longer in control. And I want you to be, um, I want you to be, to be understanding that this is your spiritual act of worship. This is what worship looked like. It's whole life, not merely Sunday morning. Is worship Sunday morning? You bet it is. But again, we've, we've demonstrated that, that, that worship is like the, the working of the heart. The heart draws in the blood and oxygenates it, and then it sends it out to do its work to give that life. And so this is what our, our worship is about. But worship is not Sunday only. Worship is, is, is seven days a week. Sunday is the ignition for Monday and Tuesday. And if you don't learn to live worship, in view of God's mercy, you're always going to be living under the lie that God is not good. You're always going to be living under the lie that God's love has failed and is not big enough. If you don't really learn to worship seven days a week, your faith is never really going to translate. And you're never really going to be able to overcome the gravity of this, this broken world. So I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. It's not something I can make you do. You've got to want to do. You've got you to see something, and, and it provokes a response inside of you. And, and, and let this be your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12.2 says this. So, so in light of all that, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. The, the Greek is, is this eon. We kind of recognize that word, right? This age. Um, But instead of letting your life look like the lives of of everybody else around you, instead of letting your life look like more broken, more selfish, more ego, um, more more self-will and control, instead of letting your life look like what is natural in this world, your life is going to be radically different. Your life is going to have a new pattern a new rhythm. Your life is going to have a new soundtrack, a new song behind it. You know, in in the movies, um, I I don't know if you've ever, like maybe you're in a conversation, you're watching a movie, you're in a conversation and you mute it, right? It's amazing how, how things change when you mute the sound on a movie. Suddenly things go from like really moving to pretty ordinary, right? (laughs) And, and, um, it's kind of like freeze framing. We were we were uh, talking the other day, and 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 and, uh, and Marsh and I were actually we were, we were sitting in front watching news, and then we were trying to talk, so we paused. And the announcer's face is in one of those you know awkward positions. Is like, oh, you know, sorry about that. You know, there's like, well, see, see these these kinds of 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 subtractions are what happens to our life when we subtract worship. When the soundtrack of of God's love is playing in your life, life looks different. When Morgan Freeman is narrating your story, there's a different nobility to what's going on. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm just driving here, but I'm not just driving here. You know, I'm driving. And, And when... When the view of God's mercy is the soundtrack, the song, the rhythm, the narration of your life, things are different. And and you're going to live to a new pattern and and, and in a new way. And and you're going to be transformed. So, So be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then, the scripture says, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. And, and I want to just caution you that the last part of that is not like then you're going to get a road map. No, no, no. The, the point is then out of a living relationship, you're going to be able to know what, what is of God in life and, and what isn't. So we're talking about worship as, in a series entitled Worth More. And, and we've contrasted what's worth more to what's worth less, right? So, so this world is worth less than heaven. That's... That's a part of our foundations of our faith. This uh, this age, less than eternity. And and we all have to choose between worth less and worth more. That's the choice of your life. That's going to be ultimately what gives you um, a life worth living at your funeral and a life worth celebrating or a life that makes people sad when they remember it. 
This world and this age is terminally ill, and if we live in its pattern according to its song, um, if we live out its sad story of broken, then, then all we're doing, honestly, is dying slowly. So you can think you got this world by the tail. You can think you don't need Jesus. You can think that, you've, you, know, that you can um, make it fine without God, but, but the reality is you're, you're just deceived in, in your brokenness. Worship is how the mind and life is made new, and new matters. I'm not talking about new cars and stuff like that. I'm saying that new matters. You know, there's a reason why you need to sleep. It's because after, you're, after the day, you're mentally done. How many of you all are like, you know, you can identify to, to the zombie shows because you are one, like 7.38, sometime around, the, you know, there. I mean, if you've given your all during the day, you tend to be spent, and how many of y'all wake up in the morning, and even before your first cup of coffee, like, you're just a joy to be around? There's some of you. There's some of you. <laughs> how many of you are, are, are decent human beings after the first cup of coffee? Okay. All right. There is something about waking up. You know, when I wake up, um, I, I, I do hear a rumor that eventually there will be sun again on planet Earth. <laughs> I, I, I'm living in, in hope that, that one day that the temperature will rise into the 60s and 70s. August, I'm, I'm hoping for 65, 66 degrees. Thank you. <laughs> I'm there somewhere. We're back. The, the reality is that you wake up in the morning and something new has happened in you. You have been restored. Your, your, uh, the chemistry in your brain, your, your, your blood chemistry, everything is different. You are, you are in a rhythm of, of made new. And the scripture says that we need to live a life that's made new by the renewing of our minds, not to live with, with a, a mind that is mis, um, misframed, mispatterned, with a mind that is misshaped by the broken of this world, that, that worship changes our, our living. So I, I want to challenge you today to start worshiping daily. I, I feel like a lot of us as disciples are wanting to grow, but we're kind of frustrated that we're not growing. And I'm telling you today, here is how you begin to grow. You get a new mind, and, and you, you begin to learn to live according to the rhythm of worship. That, that's how it begins. And and, and, and you've got to, in your discipleship, in your following of Jesus, you've got to realize that you are called to every day live worship, to worship daily. You're not called to merely come once a week and listen to somebody else. You are called to listen to your Father. He loves you. He knows your name every day uh, with the rising of the sun. He's calling you into his presence. So setting aside some time every day, whether it's morning, noon, or night, you know, it doesn't have to be a specific time, but for, for many of us, a specific time helps. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be in the morning, but morning is, is often good because, hey, you're starting your day, and, and it's good to kind of have a new mind before you start a day. If you're absolutely just a, not a morning person, well, we're not into legalism here. You know, if, if, you, if you, you know, can, can do 10 or 11 o'clock at night and spend meaningful time with God, um, Gwen Hubbard has introduced the Church of Seven Run to prayer napping. Um, good, good. She didn't hear about this. But, but I'm just saying, if your worst time is right before you go to sleep, then why offer that to God, right? I'm going to have the most meaningful conversation of my day when I don't even remember my name, you know. I'm just dead right now. So... If you are not in the habit of worshiping daily, if you're not in the habit of having a daily quiet time, I want you to think about this as the next step up in your call to Christ. This is the next step forward. This, this is how things begin to move and change in your life. So start worshiping daily, read scripture, pray reality, take real time to acknowledge the, the love of, of Jesus. So, so I want to share with you this morning that worship um, in view of God's mercy is introducing the bad of life to the hope of God, which is the unfailing love of Jesus. And so there's this movement in personal worship. 
that takes all the hard and the bad and the broken and the sin of life. And, and literally, I want you to think about it for just a moment as, as introducing that to, to the unfailing love of Jesus. Hey, discouragement, I want you to meet my Savior, Jesus Christ. You're telling me that I'm, I'm broken and defeated and, and I'm worthless. But, but he's saying something different. I don't even want to talk to you anymore. So, hey, discouragement, you just come and here's Jesus. You have a conversation, but I just want you to know I'm listening to him, not you. And, and I'm, I'm serious when I say that, that you, you and I need to remember Easter. We need to remember to apply the hope of Easter to the hopelessness in our lives. Um, death didn't win, did it? Easter was just last week. We haven't forgotten already, right? So, so the scripture says in Matthew 28, 6, he is not here. He has risen just as he said. And then there's something after that that says, come and see. Well, that's a part of the rhythm of worship, to live life in view of God's mercy. What kind of mercy does God have? It's not a weak mercy. It's not an insipid mercy. It's not a beaten or defeated mercy. It is a, an unfailing mercy. It's an unstoppable mercy. It's a mercy that cannot die, that cannot lose. And so I, I want you again to, to understand that your mind needs to be made new every day. You know, in recovery, you know, we, we talk about stinking thinking. And the truth is that there's so much stinking thinking going on in marriage, in, in, in lives, even in churches, in so many churches. There's so much stinking thinking going on in terms of, of being religious and, and controlling and, and about appearances. All that's garbage. Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. And, and if the love and joy and peace the patience, the goodness, the kindness, the gentleness, and the self-control of Jesus are not, are not the, the rhythm and the song of your life, then your mind is, is it's polluted. It's, it's, well, every week we, we take stuff out and put it at the front of our, our yards, right, most of us? Oh, yeah. Right? So you gather stuff up, you put it in a bag, you take it out, and you put it out, out there. Why, why do we do that? To be picked up. Yeah, to, to be taken away because it's, it's worthless. It doesn't belong in the house anymore. It doesn't contribute. Have any of y'all ever had one of those refrigerator events? You know what I'm saying? You open the door, and there's something in there. <laughs> Something's alive somewhere. Or something died somewhere. <laughs> Have you ever had trouble finding it? You know? Um, well, you know, that, that's the point, is, is that that thing, eh, it's not worth anything anymore. I'm not eating that, right? And I'm certainly not serving it to my guests. So it's worth less, so I'm going to take it out and, and let it be removed. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world any longer, this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to take out the garbage, and you got to let it be replaced with something new. And, and, and the reality is that, that in remembering Easter, um, that we know that, that Jesus has risen. His love did not fail. And then he invites us, the angel invites us, come and see. And that's a part of what worship is. I, I can't explain worship to you in, in a two plus two kind of way. Right? Worship is more than any human being can explain. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's... There are feelings associated with it, but it's not primarily a feeling. Um, it's this encounter. It's this experience. It's this dynamic relationship. It's, it's this mystery. It's this invitation. It's this, it's this encounter with, with the divine. It's, it's the ordinary meeting the extraordinary, the old being replaced by the new. It's, it's the energy of heaven overcoming the, the deadness of earth. It's all these things and, and a million things more. And every day... God's calling you to, to take out the garbage, to spend time with him, to be still, to know that he's God. Come and see that the resurrection is true. So, so in worshiping your way through your life, I, I want you to know that worship is the everyday practice of putting our hope in the unfailing love of Jesus in view of God's mercy. Horizon to horizon, realizing that we live in a world that is broken and bad and failing and sinking. And yet, beyond that and in control of everything is an infinite love that does not override our free will, but that will lift us and rescue us at any point that we let it. 
And this love is 360 degrees. It's eternal in every direction. You can travel a billion light years in any direction and not reach the end of the universe. And the creator of that is beyond that. And the unfailing love of God is infinite in every direction. Worship is every day. It's a practice. It's a discipline that you need to call yourself to. Right? This is, this is breathing kind of level of living. If you don't do this, you can't live well. Your thinking is going to be of this world, of this age, and, and, and you may look around to other people uh, for confirmation, but, but again, if you look around in a pigsty and say, I'm, I'm no worse than you, you're still a pig. So, so here's the reality. Nothing's worth more than God's love alive in your life. And, and, and the scripture says in Psalm 36, 7, how priceless is your unfailing love. So here we are, we're talking about what's worth more and what's worth less. Now, now we, we've said that, that, that we're not to be conformed to the patterns of this age because the pattern of this world, this age, it's worth less than the pattern of God. That's worth more. And worship is about, worth, uh, is, is about acknowledging what's worth more and moving towards what's worth more. So, so here's, here's kind of the pattern of, of how this works. Um, in, in life, we, we move through life, and, but, but in a broken world, um, we're going to run into worthless all the time. Some things are obviously worthless, and we know they're wrong. Cheating on your wife, cheating on your husband. Stealing something from work, lying, um, you know, taking credit for something you shouldn't take credit for, um, you know, being insecure and, and over responding to, to something, you know, that, you know, man, I, I should have taken the high road. There are certain things that we know that's that's down. That's bad. That's broken. There's a whole lot of other things that that are perfectly kind of acceptable in this world as well. You know, stand up for yourself. Well, I'm not saying that Christians are, you know. Christians are like Christ. How did he do? You know, um, he wasn't a doormat for anybody. But how 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 big a uh, role did his ego play in uh, in his life on earth? So there's a lot of things that you can do that that are perfectly natural and acceptable on this of this world. But but both of them are are worthless. And not just for now, but but forever. And, and so you and I can live our lives and, and we can say things like, I can't help it. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm one alcoholic that I, I dealt with uh, in my family. You know, I, I can't help it. I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm born this way. Uh, I'm a loser. There's no hope for me. I, I try, but I, I can't. Um, and you just don't know how bad it is to be me. It's like, okay, um, two things. Number one, I, I don't know how bad it is to be you, so tell me about it. Number two, let me tell you about someone who can change things. And, and now you've got a choice to make. You and I can live in our self-pity. We can live in our excuses. We can live in this world justifying how we are. But all of this is worth less than, than what, what God has called us to, and that is the infinite love of Christ. And worship is making a turn from what's worth less into what's worth more infinitely more, um, for, forever worth more. And, and all through heaven, it just increases and grows. You'll never be bored in heaven. You'll never reach the end of it. You'll never um, you know, be able to comprehend, wrap your mind around all the good that God is. And, and so you can live a down life if you want. You can live a life that's worthless. Or because of the infinite love of God, because of the unfailing love of God, you can believe and, and worship and answer your call into a life that's worth more. God takes away every I can't excuse, right? Because, because remember, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. You're dead, buried with Christ in baptism. Your old spirit is gone, and, and, and you've been completely replaced by a new spirit, the spirit of Christ. You got no excuses. None of us have any excuses. And the simple reality is we're all going to do what we want to do. Years ago in high school, um, I, 
I started to, to work my, my senior, junior year, especially my senior year, full time um, at our, our church as a, as a, a minister of maintenance. <laughs> hey, it's a title. I was a janitor. And, um, and I mopped and swept and buffed floors for 40 hours a week to save money for college, right? That's the only way I was going to get there. And, um, and, and so, you know, this, this time... Uh, you know, going to school in the mornings, and then, and 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 our youth pastor started a, a 6:30 a.m. Bible study. Well, I, you know, it's like, well, I'm in school and I'm working, and I, I'm talking to him, and I'm saying, well, you know, David, I'd love to do this, but I've got this, 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 and this going on, and I'm trying to justify it. And David said, it's okay, Drew, it's okay. You're going to do what you want to do. It's like, shut up. <laughs> I want to hear that. You know, I just gave some really good excuses. I'm impressed with him. And I walked away and I'm going, doggone it, I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> you know, if I want to be there, I will. If I don't, I won't. And it's the same with all of us. You and I can make all kinds of excuses why we're so busy, I don't have time to worship. Let me tell you this, folks. You're too busy not to pray. You're too busy not to worship. There's too much of value at stake for you not to go into what's worth more. In, in fact, why would you want to, in, in all that's at stake in your living, why would you want to live from what's worth less? This is the move of worship. It's the move into worth more. And this is, this is what I'm calling each one of us to make a daily practice. So, Seven Run, I'm asking you to commit every day to learn to worship. You, you got me? Yes. All right, so this means yes, this means no. Yes. Are we clear? I'm not saying that you're agreeing to do it right now, but I want to be clear that you understand what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to let the Holy Spirit lead you into time every day with God in which you read scripture and in which you worship, you acknowledge the unfailing love of God. Are, are we clear in what I'm asking? Yes. Okay, thank you. So while we'll all naturally make worthless decisions, every day Jesus invites us and leads us into the adventure of his unstoppable love. He said in Matthew 4, 9, 4 19, follow me. <laughs> That's the adventure every single day. No matter how much you, you messed up yesterday, Jesus is there with the dawn saying, hey, follow me. I, I'm going to lead you through life. And, and his love will never fail. Exodus 15, 13 says, in your unfailing love, you will lead the people you've redeemed in your strength. You will guide them. You see, one of the things that, that is a worship killer is believing that God has not been good to us and that his love has failed. But I want to introduce you to one of the most profound words in the Old Testament. It is the word chesed, or C-H-E-S-E-D. It is the word that is difficult to translate because it's no single word can, can work with it. It's the word that you'll often see translated as unfailing love, but it's faithful, loving kindness. Um, it, is, it is love that never stops, never ends, never fails. Um, it is... It is the heart of the description of, of really, I think, of God in the Old Testament. If there's one word I would choose to use for God in the Old Testament, this is it. His love is unfailing. And there are times in life where it looks like his love has failed. Certainly, I, I would think that, that Friday before Easter, it looked like his love had failed. And there's going to be times and seasons in your life where you're going to be tempted to say God's love has failed he is not there. Uh, he, is not, he is not able. But I'm telling you that the unfailing love of God is all through the Old Testament. It is, it is absolutely stamped forever in the skies in, in the name of Jesus as the unfailing love of God. And, and nothing's worth more than, than God's unfailing love. How priceless is your unfailing love? And worship is the everyday practice of putting your hope in God's unfailing love. Not your understanding, not your reason, but, but your hope. And there's times where that's all you got. 
Man, I'm, I'm hoping God will come through for, for me. I'm, I, I, I can't see how this is going to play out, but, but Jesus, my hope is in you. Your love has never failed. It looks like it's going to fail now, but I'm believing that, it, that it's an unfailing love. And, and in spite of what I see and what I feel and what's happened to me, just as beautiful story and her vulnerability, in spite of, of what's just happened in my family, I'm, I do not believe God's love has failed. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you've redeemed. <laughs> God will lead you through life, and he'll lead you in his strength, Exodus 15, 13 says. And the joy of it all is it's never too late to turn from worthless. It's never too late. As long as you have breath, as long as you're alive, today is a new day. Your life can begin to turn around today. Uh, the, the story that God wants to write from you, the story that he's imagined for you from the beginning can become a reality, begin to, to come into play if, if you let it. It's never too late to turn from worthless. Psalm 6, 4, it says, Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. God's unfailing love is, is the background for our worship. And the truth is, if we don't worship daily, the dying world is always going to win in us. It, it's always going to win in us. Um, Psalm 119.76 says um, that, you know, may your unfailing love be my comfort according to, the, to your promise to your servant. We're either going to conform to a, a worthless world or we're going to conform to the promise of, of Scripture, the promise of an unfailing love. There are going to be times in your life where you're going to look out through the windshield of your life and you're going to say, there's no way I'm going to make it through this. And then you're going, going to get aside with God and you're going to worship and you're going to, to read scripture and you're, gonna, you're going to be confronted with the lives of people who put their hope in God in times past. And, and did any of them ever finish poorly who put their hope in God's unfailing love? None. And then you're going to be comforted by the unfailing love. Gravity wins until worship does. And if you remember nothing else I, I say in your life, and if you want a good life, if you want a life of love and joy and peace, if you want a life that's connected to God, a life of purpose, a life of that's just good, just recognize this. Gravity, the gravity of this broken world, the gravity of your old nature, the gravity of your sin and mine, it's always going to work, win, always going to win, until love does, until worship changes everything. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. Stop being passive and fight back through worship. There's so many of us here who in life are getting our tails kicked by, by addictions, by pornography, by self-pity, by discouragement, um, you know, by work. <laughs> There's so many of us who are getting our tails kicked by, by our failures, by our past. And I'm telling you, you got to fight back. Right? you got to do the work of your life. Nobody can breathe for you. Nobody can eat for you. You've got to do what you're called to do. Worship is a, is a choice more than a feeling. But I trust your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation, Psalm 13, 5 says. Psalm 52, 8 says, I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. In this hard moment, in this moment of suffering and death, I choose to put my trust in the unfailing love of God. I remember Easter. I remember the resurrection. I, I, I may feel I'm in the pain of the crucifixion, but I remember what happens after, and Lord, I put my hope in your unfailing love. And there is something mysterious about, about bringing your heart and mind into the reality of God's unfailing love. There's this, this experience, this exchange that, that happens. It's called worship. And this is what you and I are called to. See, eventually, you and I uh, have to decide who we're more afraid of, the world or the Lord, because fear of one cancels out fear of the other. And there's so many of us in this auditorium right now who are just living lives that are terrorized by fear. Guys, here's the answer to that. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love, Psalm 147 says. If you fear the Lord, you will fear nothing else. <laughs> And if you do not fear the Lord, you will fear everything else. 
But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. There, I'm just telling you, when, when you pause in life, when you turn off the TV, when you give yourself permission just to be silent and still and alone with God for 15 minutes, for 30 minutes, for an hour every day, when you take your pain and your problems and, and your fear and you introduce them to the unfailing love of God whose name is Jesus, something happens. Hope rises in you. That's what worship is. It's not a performance. It's not just chasing a feeling. It's, it's hope lifting you up from worth less into worth more. And then you walk away encouraged, strong. You walk away with the vision of God. You walk away with the word of God in your, in your ears. You walk away with, with strength. And if you're wondering why your Christian walk isn't working, it's because many of us just aren't walking. You've got to work the walk. And the way we work the walk is through, is through worship. And it's going to cost you. Again, religion is going to keep worship costs low, manageable. But faith in Jesus is going to let worship cost whatever it costs. That's why Jesus went out overnight time and time and time again just to be with Father. So I'm telling you, it may kill you to turn off uh, NCIS. It may kill you to, to miss your favorite car show, guys. But I promise you that that, that half hour with God could transform your family. And, and you putting your, your faith in the unfailing love of, of Jesus is going to give you a new vision and energy of life. So here's what I want you to do, is to put your hope in the unfailing love of Jesus every day. Every day. Well, Pastor Drew, I don't have much hope. Put the mustard seed of your hope in the unfailing love of Jesus, and watch what happens. Isaiah 54.10 says, Though the mountains will be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. You are infinitely loved. There are going to be times in your life where it feels like everything is shaking. The ground beneath your feet is spreading. Um, everything is about to fail, but God is saying to you, that although all that is going on in your life, my unfailing love will never, will never end. It will never let you down. So put your hope in me and watch what happens. Here's some very practical ways to, to do that. Set aside time daily to, to be with God. You know, this is, your, this is your discipline. This is your call. You eat every day. Um, you groom every day. Some of y'all take a long time. <laughs> but that's why you look so good. <laughs> and you do that because that's what it takes to do life. This is what it takes to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. This is what it takes to live in the unfailing love of God. You have to love with time. Focus on the love of Jesus and be still. Focus. Focus on the unfailing love of Jesus and be still. If you're one of those people whose life always has to be filled with noise, there's stuff going on in your heart that you're running from. Share your real story with Father, good and bad, sorrow and joy. I don't know how to pray. Yeah, you do. If you've ever talked to anybody in your life and been real once, then you know how to be real with God. If you know how to pray, do it. Focus on the unfailing love of Jesus. Whatever you're going through. In fact, right now, think about what's most discouraging to you in, in, in life. What's the most discouraging thing in your life? Biggest fear? I want you to take that thing by the hand. In your mind, silly as it sounds. I want you to walk over with it. I want you to introduce it to Jesus. Hey, fear, fill in the blank. Hey, loneliness, hey, abandonment. Hey, sexual abuse. Hey, depression. I want you to meet my Jesus. He rose from the dead. 
His love will never fail. He loves me. I'm with him, not with you. Watch what happens. Love wins. If you let it, <laughs> you focus on the unfailing love of Jesus and you give thanks, you give thanks until love wins your heart for the day. <laughs> and then you rinse and repeat and do it again until you see God. And then forevermore, you're going to live alive in the unfailing love of God. Because I'm asking you in the name of Jesus not to live down here and up then. I'm asking you to live up now and up then. I'm asking you to, to put your hope in the unfailing love of God regardless of all that's discouraging you. So right now, will you bow your head? And will you do just that? Just make the choice, the worship choice, to put your hope right now God's unfailing love for you. Name Jesus.